Hi. Unfortunately, one of the classes got uh, recorded over for my son's birthday, and I need to re-go over the information here, so I'm going to do that now. Uh, one of the things that we need to consider when we're talking about t-tests and any other type of test are the, the null hypotheses that we're using. And one thing that a number of students have brought up earlier that I haven't really talked about much at all has to do with the tails. So, under the null hypothesis, we're predicting something. In a one-tail t-test, we're predicting that the mean of the population is equal to some value. For a two-tail uh, t-test, typically we're saying that the difference between the means is equal to some value. And for a paired t-test, often we're saying that the mean difference is going to be equal to some value. So the value that we are predicting under the null hypothesis, that's just going to be this value right here, labeled h naught for the null hypothesis. Now, this is a, a, my best approximation to a normal distribution, given my handwriting. And we notice a couple things. One, the normal distribution, it should be symmetrical around the mean, and it has a lot of the means that we should see under the null hypothesis um, close to this value labeled here as a null hypothesis. Now, we know that for any reasonable sample size that the standard error of the means is going to be approximately normal. So this is why you're going to see the normal distribution used again and again and again in statistics courses. So we have this normal distribution which is representing the, um, the null or the hypothesized null uh, mean and then also the standard error of the means whether that's a uh, difference between the means or um, a mean difference or whatever it is that we're considering. So, we have some null hypothesis. Here's the mean. We're expecting the standard error of the means to, um, to get smaller as we increase sample size um, and to get smaller as we do other manipulations, which we'll talk about a little bit in the future. But one thing I want to point out is that this whole distribution, the probability of observing any potential mean is equal to 1. So if we were to shade the whole thing in, the probability of observing anything in that distribution is 1. Now, we are going to break this distribution up into pieces based on what our null hypothesis is and also based on the alpha level that we're picking. So the traditional alpha level is 0.05, right? And 0.05 says that um, we are going to incorrectly reject the null 5% of the time. So what we need to do is figure out what parts of this distribution is related to 5%. So we could do this in a number of ways. There might be a little thin bar in here that could represent 5% of the data, but that's not really that extreme. If you think about a p-value, a p-value is the probability of observing uh, a result as or more extreme than what we've observed due to chance underneath the null hypothesis. So this isn't really extreme at all. What's extreme? Well, these parts of the distribution, the tails, are extreme. So we've got the body and the tails. So if we were to take this 5% and put it just in the tails, we might have something like this. So the shaded areas are representing 5%. And these should be the same size, but forgive my handwriting. So, what type of null hypothesis is associated with a two-tailed test or a two-tailed null hypothesis? The null hypothesis, H naught, that let's just go with a one-sample t-test, that the mean is equal to some value, let's say 700, because that's what we've used a number of times. This is two-tailed. It's saying that the mean is this value here, which in this case would be 700. And it's saying that What's extreme would be anything that is either greater than 700 or less than 700. So the alternative hypothesis basically represents what the extreme things are that we're looking for. And we're looking for extreme values that are not equal to 700. So they could be values above the null hypothesis or below the null hypothesis. Now, you don't have to set up a null hypothesis like this. You could set up a null hypothesis to say that the um, mean, the population mean, is greater than or equal to 700. So imagine 
that you are interested in buying some bottled water, something that has uh, 700 uh, milliliters listed as the amount of water that it contains. Well, you don't mind so much if you're getting more than 700 milliliters on average. That means that you're getting more than what you paid for. But if you are getting less than 700 milliliters on average, that's a problem. So the alternative hypothesis in this situation is going to be opposite of the direction specified in the null. So if we've specified greater here, the alternative will be less than. So if we're using the same alpha, instead of splitting it up into both tails, we can't really do that anymore since this isn't that extreme. This is something that we're expecting underneath the null hypothesis. So what is extreme? Well, anything that is less than 700 is extreme. And by setting up our alpha, we're saying how extreme something needs to get before we are going to conclude that it's probably unlikely that the null hypothesis is correct. Now, if this earlier represented half of alpha, then this is really only 2.5% of the data underneath this normal distribution. And if alpha is 5, what happens is this criterion gets shifted over a little bit. So now we don't have to observe something that is as extreme before in sense of as extreme just in the 700 level. Um, so earlier we might have rejected the null hypothesis, let's say if, if the earlier cutoff was 730, well now we might be able to reject the null hypothesis if we observe something like 732. So this makes it easier for us to reject the null hypothesis if the alternative that we're interested in just has to do with one tail. So as or more extreme completely depends on the type of hypothesis that you're asking. If you are saying something like this, then the only things that are extreme, as or more extreme, are basically the value you observed and everything more extreme in the same direction. If, however, you have the bidirectional hypothesis, then things on either side are extreme. So in this situation, we would split up alpha into two pieces where we've got half of alpha on each of our tails. In the one-tailed example, we're putting all of our alpha on a single tail to make it easier to reject an null hypothesis um, when it's false. And we'll need a smaller observed value to do that. Okay, so the next thing that I spent most of the class talking about had to do with power and the types of things that affect power. But before we get into the types of things that affect power, let's first talk a little bit about what power is and the, the different um, conclusions we can come to given our data and um, the different truths that the data really do actually represent. So you can imagine the truth for any type of question is either that there is some effect of something or no effect of something. Um, if we have no effect and we conclude that there actually was an effect, it's like saying there's a fire when there's not. And what do you call it when you say that there's a fire and there isn't? Well, that's a false alarm. Now, the false alarm in um, terms of the errors that we make when we're testing hypotheses is known as a type one error or an alpha error. And the probability of making a false alarm is equal to alpha. So alpha is under complete control of the experimenter or the researcher. So the researcher sets alpha and that's what it is. So we can know exactly what the probability of making a type 1 error is based on the alpha level that some researcher chooses. Now, sort of the um, opposite of a false alarm, when there really is no effect, is a correct rejection. Now, if you think about probabilities, as I said, all the probabilities under some distribution have to add up to one. So here, I've drawn two distributions. I've drawn a distribution for the mean underneath a, a null hypothesis, and I've also drawn a distribution for the mean that we actually observed centered around the observed mean. So if we're thinking about no effect, this is the truth. We're really working with this. So this is the truth for this situation. There's no effect. Now imagine that we're doing a one-tailed t-test. 
And let's say that we're going to be interested only in this tail that's over here, okay? So let's say we're using the traditional alpha level, so that means that 5% of all of the observations that we would observe when no effect is the actual truth would fall in this tail right there. Now consider this entire distribution here is representative of the truth, right? And we set up here, imagine that the truth is no effect. So the false alarm or type one error is represented by this portion that would go off to infinity over here. Whereas the correct rejection is equal to one minus alpha, right? All of the probabilities have to add up to one for a particular distribution. So if this is the alpha error, then this is going to be the probability of a correct rejection. Any of the means that we observe when that is the truth that are within this section going on to negative infinity are indicative that um, are, are going to lead us to fail to reject the null hypothesis. So whereas this represents the alpha error, which is just the probability, or which the probability of is just alpha, this represents our correct rejection region, the probability of which is just one minus alpha. Now, let's consider a different situation. Imagine in this situation, the truth actually is that there is an effect, that our manipulation produced some effect. Or maybe in the terms of a one um, sample t-test, not that there's an effect, but that the mean that we observe is different from the value that we were predicting underneath the null hypothesis. In that situation, we're going to assume that this mean, because it's an unbiased estimator of the true population mean, is the mean that actually represents the truth. So in the situation where the truth really is that there's an effect, where the truth really is that the mean is different, now it's this, not tooth, truth. It's this distribution that represents the truth. So let's take a look at this distribution and break it up into pieces. We're going to use the same criterion that we had under the null to break up our distribution into pieces. Well, let's think about different things that could happen. Imagine that the truth is that there's an effect, but we didn't end up rejecting the null because the mean wasn't extreme enough. This would mean that the mean fell over in this part of the tail. So, if this is the cutoff, then this portion of the distribution underneath the alternative hypothesis is going to represent misses, right? Because the truth really is that there was an effect or that the mean was different. However, the mean that we actually observed, it wasn't extreme enough for us to say, aha, we're going to reject an all hypothesis and conclude that there was an effect. So this is basically a miss, right? The, the effect, the truth is that there was an effect, but we couldn't see it. So the probability that we make a miss, and I should write in one more thing. A miss is known as a type two error. And just as the probability of a type one error is represented by the first letter of the Greek alphabet, alpha, the type two error, the probability of that is represented by the Greek letter beta. So the probability of a miss is just going to be beta. Now, what beta is really depends on a number of different things. It depends on how far apart these distributions are spread. It depends how uh, much spread there is around the, the mean that we actually observe. So think about the standard error of the mean. And it depends on the criterion. If we shifted the criterion up to, or down, to here, let's say we did a two um, tail test instead of a one, so we would also reject the mean if it fell over here. Now, notice how more of this distribution would fit in this region where we fail to reject. So, if we know things, if we know what the standard error of the mean is, if we know the um, size of the effect, um, and we know what alpha is, we can calculate beta, the probability of making a type 2 error. 
But for this course, we're not going to worry so much about calculating it as much as worrying about what things mean. So just to reiterate, the probability that we observe a mean that is beneath our criterion when really the truth is that there's an effect or that the mean is different, that's this section here, and that represents a type 2 error, the probability of which is beta. Now, again, for any single distribution, the values, all of the potential values in that distribution have to add up to 1. So this means that this section here plus whatever is over here is going to have to equal 1. So let's think about this. If this represents the possibility that we miss an effect that's there, what's going to represent the possibility that we detect the, um, the effect that's there? Well, if we detect something that's there, it's like a hit. Think about baseball. So if we think the ball is there and we say it's there, we get a hit. So a hit, we call the probability of getting a hit power. And that's represented by, let's get a different color chart, the area beyond the criterion for what is extreme enough. So this is the probability of making a hit, which is power. And what's the probability, um, or what is power? Power is just 1 minus beta, right? If the probability of this is beta, then the probability of everything beyond that has to be 1 minus beta. So hopefully you have um, a decent understanding of the probabilities of making these different types of conclusions given different situations of truth. So now what I want to do is talk about how different things are going to affect power and affect also the probability of making a type 2 error. Because anything that's going to affect power is going to affect the probability of making a uh, type 2 error. We can see this by imagining that we shift the um, criterion down even more. Maybe we use a really, really small alpha. So notice now that the probability that we make a type 2 error, this is a much larger region, so it's going to be much larger. And now this region is much smaller. So we have an increased probability of making type 2 errors, but a decreased probability of, uh, or a decreased power, or probability of identifying the effect that's real. Let's first see how sample size is going to affect power. Imagine we have some sample size n, and the value that we're predicting underneath the null is here, and our actual observation is there. We observe some variance of the sample, and we use that variance to create the standard of the error of the mean that we're then going to use to indicate what the normal distribution should look like. In all of these examples, the height of both of these distributions should be the same, and the width should also be the same. So if they're not, don't assume that that's a difference. It just is uh, uh, an artifact of my inability to draw perfectly. So if we look at the situation, and let's say now that the truth really is that there was an effect or that the mean was different from our expectation, well, we can talk about the probability of incorrectly failing to reject the null, which is beta, and that's represented again by everything on this side of this alternative distribution, um, or at least on this side of our alpha criterion. Notice in this situation, I used a two-tail test. So we have one tail here, one tail there. So anything that's in here is going to be part of our beta. Our power, though, is the probability that we correctly reject the null hypothesis when it's false. So that's represented on everything to this side of the criterion. And also, since this is a two-tailed test, we have another criterion over here. So this probability, or these probabilities there, are really, really tiny. Um, but they are something. So the power for the two-tailed situation would be represented by everything more extreme given both criteria. Um, but primarily, I'm just going to focus on this since this is a fairly trivial amount. It, it's something, so don't forget about it. But the important points that I want to make have to do more with the bulk of the distribution there. So now let's say we take another sample. And 
the sample is uh, much larger than it was before. So it's not n, but it's n plus something else. Maybe m, maybe it's twice as large, three times as large, a couple larger. Now what happens as we get a larger sample size? One of the things that happens with the larger sample size is that the standard error of the mean decreases. Now this isn't going to push things farther away in the sense that these means are all of a sudden getting farther apart in an absolute sense. Instead what it means is that the distributions are going to be more tightly packed. So if I were to redraw these types of distributions, we should have something like this. Let's see if I can figure out exactly the difference. So there. And let me redraw the first one, sorry. So, <laughs> my drawing stinks. So I tried to make sure that these differences between these distributions, in absolute sense, are identical. It's not pushing the mean farther away or anything else. But what it is doing is it's pulling in the tails of the distribution. So more is closer to the hypothesized or the alternative means. What this means is that our rejection regions, if we still have the 5% and we have it for both tails, what ends up happening is that we have a much smaller probability for the beta error. Notice how this is just a, a small fraction of this distribution as compared to this one over here. And the probability of uh, correctly rejecting the null hypothesis is much, much greater. It's a much bigger part of that distribution. So when we take a larger sample size, the standard error of the mean shrinks up, and this has the effect of um, not only pulling this criterion a bit closer to the hypothesized mean, but also since the standard error of the means are smaller, it's going to mean that less of this distribution will fall within the fail to reject region. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about effect size. So effect size basically has to do with how far apart these distributions are spaced. So here, the observed mean is so far away from the um, predicted mean. Now, if we have a larger effect size, that means that the observed mean should end up farther away. Um, so how could we do this? If we think about, uh, we want to see if people's cortisol levels increase when they get frightened, we could show them uh, different types of potentially frightening movies. So I have some kids, and one of the things that my kids have watched over the years is uh, Bob the Builder. So in Bob the Builder, there's this one uh, cranny or something, and he's constantly afraid, and he's almost going to uh, run over a porcupine or something. Actually, that might be a different character. But anyway, so imagine the suspense in Bob the Builder is building. Oh my goodness, how much cortisol are people producing? Now this is a pretty weak manipulation, right? We wouldn't expect a lot of people to have a strong visceral re reaction to watching some um, claymation uh, porcupine face potential death, right? Especially in the playful way that they do it in Bob the Builder. Um, so we could have a situation where they're watching that and other people are watching, uh, you know, nothing scary at all, just some pretty nature scenes, the, the um, what am I thinking of? The, the waves lapping up on the beach, not at all scary. So imagine that we've done that here. Now, what would be the difference in cortisol levels if instead of looking at pretty nature scenes and sort of scary Bob the Builder with like pretty nature scenes and Saw or some other scary, much scarier uh, movie scene? Well, what should happen is that the distributions should go much farther apart from one another. So if this is the null, I'm trying to make it so that way the standard error of the mean is exactly the same, and this is our alternative. Notice how the alternative mean is so much farther away from the hypothesized mean. 
Also, if we were to create the rejection regions, boop, 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 boop. Now, since this distribution goes all the way off to negative and positive infinity, there will be some, you know, probability of observing some mean there, but it's really minimal. And look, almost the entire distribution is over here. So this would mean that we have absolutely a ton of power. Wow. And we have a very, very small probability of a type 2 error, which would be represented by the probabilities representing this distribution within this area where we are going to fail to reject the null. So sample size pulled in the standard error of the means. By using the stronger manipulation, we end up pushing a mean farther away. So another way that we can increase power and decrease the probability of making a type 2 error is by increasing our alpha size. So again, we have sort of the default situation over here. And if we were to plot the same two distributions, they're the same because alpha size isn't going to affect the standard error of the mean or the distance between those means. So I'm going to try to do this as close as I can. Probably gonna fail a bit, but uh, that's okay. So let's say that these are exactly equal. And here, with using an alpha of 0.05, I should only have 2.5% of uh, the, each tail represented there. But now if I'm using an alpha of 0.2, that means I'm making uh, a type 1 error 20% of the time when the null hypothesis is true. That's really bad. But by using such a huge alpha, we can see exactly what effect this is going to have. So basically with an alpha of 0.2, 20% of the distribution predicted by the null hypothesis should be in the tails. So this is going to make these tails much, much larger. Now notice, by making the tails much larger, we shifted the criterion. Instead of being over like here, now the criterion is over here. What effect does this have? Well, we get more power because of this because more of this distribution is falling in the region that we're going to reject. We're also going to have a smaller probability of a type 2 error, but this way of increasing power is one that you should really try to shy away from. Because when you increase alpha, you increase the probability of making an alpha error or of making a type 1 error. So although this will increase our power by making alpha much larger, it's coming at a very heavy cost. Now, all of the things typically come at a heavy cost. Um, well, maybe not all of the things. I was going to say there's really not much of a difference in cost between showing Bob the Builder and showing Saw. But if you think about N, increasing the sample size, it's going to take more time to collect those data. It's going to be more expensive to collect those data. Um, so everything comes with a cost, but this one comes at a cost of making a different type of error. So this is one that you want to stay away from. As I alluded to a bit earlier, another way that we can increase power is by using a one-tailed test instead of a two-tailed test. So in our default here, the way I created it, we had a two-tailed test. Um, and we might see a mean, so if this is an independent uh, samples t-test, we might have a, a null hypothesis like the mean one is equal to mean two, which means that things on both sides are extreme. Now what would happen if we had this other null hypothesis? The mean, or the first mean is less than or equal to mean two. And let's say that the yellow line now represents, or the yellow distribution represents mean one, and the blue one represents mean two. Again, the, both of these should be equally high, equally far apart, and have equally large standard errors of the mean. So if I, they look different in those ways, that's unintentional. So now in this situation, we had a criterion where we had two tails where basically all of our alpha, or not all of our alpha, where our alpha was split up over here and also over here. If we're going to put all of our alpha on one side, our criterion shifts a little bit. 
So now, all 5% are contained within that one tail. So because we've shifted our criterion from here to here, what happens is that we now have a lot more power to reject the null hypothesis. And similarly, we have a, a much smaller chance of making a type 2 or a beta error. So if we have a good reason to expect that the means will be different in a particular direction, using this type of hypothesis is a good one. However, you should make this decision to use a hypothesis like that based on what you already know. If you um, don't know which direction that the difference between the means is going to be, you analyze your data, and then you find out, oh, it's in this direction, and that's not significant, but if I put all my alpha on one side, you've just engaged in p-hacking. Don't do it. So you should only do this when you have a reason before you analyze the data to expect that the mean will be in this direction. We can imagine one reason that's important for that. Imagine that we were interested in means in both directions. We were interested in this and that, but we only used the one tail alpha. Well, only a tiny little bit of that distribution falls over there, and almost all of it's over here. So we would have a huge probability of making a type 2 error in a really tiny power for this situation. So use one tail alpha when you're justified to do so based on your pre-existing knowledge, and don't do it otherwise. When we're designing this study, we use uh, a lot of controls to try to control for extraneous variables that could impact the dependent variable. Now think about what happens when we control some variables. Imagine that I'm going to uh, test my students um, on the material that I'm covering right now. And the students um, come into class to be tested. Some of them have had breakfast and some of them haven't had breakfast. This means that whether or not they've had breakfast could influence their performance. Also, their intelligence could influence their performance. You might expect that people that are more intelligent would perform better on the test than those who haven't. You'd also expect the amount of time that they've studied to influence their performance. Um, so we can't necessarily control all of the thing, everything directly um, by changing our methods, but we could do some. So imagine I had the situation where I didn't want there to be a difference between uh, whether or not my students had had breakfast before or not they came to class. One of the things that I could do is tell my students to meet me at a restaurant beforehand and I could buy them all breakfast. Now, um, what's going to happen in a situation where we have fewer controls than when we have more? Well, by using controls and controlling for extraneous variation, there are going to be less things that are influencing the variations of the dependent variable. And by virtue of having fewer things influencing the dependent variable, the standard error of the mean should be smaller, right? There's less things contributing to variations of those means or variations within our sample. So our sample should more accurately reflect only the variations in our manipulation if we're doing an experiment or the variable that we're interested in a correlational study. So if we were to draw the equivalence over here, the two distributions should be equally far apart again. However, we should have smaller standard errors of the mean. So if we were to put in our rejection regions, we would notice that when we have more control, we get a whole lot more power and less type 2 errors. Now, there are a number of controls that we can make. So in making sure that our students get the same amount of breakfast, um, that's one way of control. I could give all of the students the exam in the same classroom. That's another form of control. I could make sure they all get the, the test at the same time. That's another form of control. I could make sure that they all get the same versions of the test in not different versions where the questions are mixed around. That would be another form of control. And by controlling for all those things that could impact how people perform on the exam, uh, think about the order of the questions. If some students get a bunch of hard questions right up front, 
Um, they might feel that the exam isn't going to be something that they can seat on or that they can succeed in, and they might give up very early. Whereas students that get those questions at the end, they've already felt good about their performance up to that point. So by using the same questions in the same order, um, what we're doing is ensuring that there aren't differences in the ordering that could potentially be affecting how students are performing. Now, there are a number of ways that we can uh, control for extraneous variables. One of the ways that, we, um, that I've been talking about has to do with actually um, controlling things, uh, physical things, the, the amount of light in a room, the, the physical room that people are in. Um, but there are other things that we can control too. So one of the things that I could do is, let's say I wanted to see if exam performance uh, was dependent on, I don't know, whatever some manipulation was, uh, different study strategies. I could pair individuals. Right? I could take the two smartest people or the two people that have performed best on previous exams and split them up and randomly assign each member of the pair to a different group. And I do that for the, the two students that have been performing the best, and then the next two students, and the next two students, and the next two students. So what this would be controlling for is the extraneous variables related to um, previous exam performance, maybe motivation and other issues. Um, so by using paired participants as opposed to not pairs, what we end up doing is we also decrease the variations because by having pairs we can look at the differences between the members of the different pairs as opposed to just looking at the differences in the distribution altogether. In that situation um, you can imagine that these two distributions are going to represent uh, mean differences so mean diffs under the null and also the mean differences uh, sorry, the mean difference is underneath the alternative hypothesis where they're both the same, but because the differences on that paired variable, if that paired variable was a good one to pair on, we're going to decrease the standard error of the mean of the differences. So that's a good thing. Um, in addition to just pairing individuals, we could go beyond that and we could use a repeated measures design. So in a repeated measures design, we're basically using each person or each school or each whatever we're interested in as their own pair. So we can directly compare their performance in one situation to their performance in another. And this is going to be so much better than just pairing people on, you know, how have you done in the class up to this point? Because how they've done up to this point doesn't necessarily affect other things um, that are going to be more constant within them. So by looking at the same individuals at time or in different conditions, we're controlling for a whole lot more extraneous variables, which is going to decrease the standard error of the means and shift the criterion so it's closer to the, um, the value that we're expecting under the null hypothesis, both of which will end up giving us more power. So that explains um, how, what power is, and how we can affect power by increasing sample size, which will increase power, by increasing alpha, which will increase power, but at a heavy cost in the probability that we make a type 1 error. Um, we can control whether or not we're using uh, a one or two tailed design. We can control uh, how strong our manipulation is. We can also use various controls to control the ways in which materials are presented or pair participants or pair individuals with themselves to greater increase um, power and decrease the probability of a type 2 error.